Let's look together in God's Word to the Gospel of Mark. We'll look together at Mark 14 and verses 1 through 11. Mark 14, verses 1 through 11, where God's Word reads as follows. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good uh, for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. So far, the reading from God's word this evening. May he add his blessing to our hearts. Well, in the morning service, our Old Testament reading has focused us of late in the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you remember back a couple of Lord's Days, we had a reading from Ecclesiastes 3, which is that very famous passage uh, where it contrasts different seasons. There's a season for this and a, and a season for that. And uh, it is explaining to us this appropriate time for all kinds of different things. It talks about a uh, time for birth and a time for death, uh, a time for killing and a time for healing, a time for weeping, and a time for laughing, a time for loving, a time for hating, and so on. And of course, there are different circumstances and different times when each of those things is appropriate. Not every time justifies the same action, the same response. And, and Jesus in this text is teaching something like that. He is saying there is something good that you can do, but there are times where it is best to leave that good thing aside and to do something else. Uh, there is this good thing, caring for the poor, uh, but that caring for the poor is, although it is a good thing, there are times where caring for the poor is not to be preferred. There is a greater opportunity, um, another circumstance that is more appropriate in, the, in, the, in that moment. And what this text does is draw our attention to what that greater good is. And that greatest good in this text, of course, greater than care for the poor, is the worship of Christ. Uh, recognizing Christ and preparing his body for burial, as it describes it here uh, in this text. Christ is a day away from offering his body on the cross, uh, a sacrifice for the sins of his people. And he is calling his disciples to pay attention to that, to see that as more important even than something as good as, as caring for the poor. And even while he calls his disciples to recognize that truth, the context of the account shows us that that truth being presented doesn't mean it is accepted. Uh, there, there are those who would reject this, this description that Christ has given, this call that Christ has given, that he would be held as the highest, the greatest and most important thing for people to focus on. And so from this text, uh, we are meant to see that nothing is as valuable as Christ and his sacrifice. And we see that, first of all, when Christ uh, talks about his anointing or this account that describes the anointing of Christ. Now, as a preacher, when you're dealing with a text like this, uh, naturally it kind of breaks into three sections, right? The first section is verses 1 and 2, the hatred of the chief priests and the scribes. Section 2 is verses 3 through 9, the account of Jesus' anointing. And then section 3 would be Jesus' uh, willingness to betray, or Judas' willingness to betray Christ. So 
Judas Iscariot as he turns on, on his, his master. And so as a, as a preacher, you kind of have to make a decision. Uh, there's, there's really three things you can do. You can, you can go A, B, C, right? You can deal with the hatred of the scribes, then the anointing story, and then the, the turning of Judas. Or you can, you can deal with both instances of hatred of Christ first, and then the anointing of Jesus second. Or, you, as I'm choosing to do, you can deal with the anointing of Jesus first. So we're going to first look at verses 3 through 9, and then we're going to deal with the instances where people will reject Christ. And so there's no necessary proper order to do that in. This is just the order that, that we're following. So the first thing we want to do is look at verses 3 through 9. And we want to see what Jesus is saying about himself here in this text. Because Mark is presenting a dilemma. Uh, Jesus is at Bethany. You remember, we've been in Bethany before. Uh, not physically, but in the account of Mark's gospel. Bethany is kind of what we would call a bedroom community of Jerusalem. Uh, it was a village outside of Jerusalem, and as Jerusalem grew, it kind of swallowed up Bethany as a, as a little village. But it's, it's outside of Jerusalem proper, but it's within walking distance of Jerusalem. And Jesus, in Bethany, which is the place where he retired, every, every time he's gone into Jerusalem, he always comes out again. He ends up in, in Bethany. He's in the house of a man called Simon the leper. Now, we don't know very much about Simon the leper. Uh, he's not defined any other place in, in Scripture. But we can be fairly clear or fairly confident that he got his nickname from a condition that he used to have. He's not a leper anymore, but he used to be a leper at some time. He's not a leper right now. We know that because if he were a leper, he would not be in a house in Bethany. If he were a leper, he would be an outcast. He would be required to live outside of the city. And so here we're dealing with a man who used to be a leper, who has been healed of his leprosy. And uh, most of the time, people seem to think it's safe to assume that he is one of the many lepers that Jesus healed uh, during his ministry. We can't say that for sure, but it seems like a, a logical connection to make. And Jesus in Bethany is at this man's house, and in verse 1, it says that he is there two days before the Passover. And what you have is this account of this woman who comes and anoints uh, Jesus with this precious ointment. And that is, in fact, a repeat performance. The same thing has happened to Jesus four days earlier. And we know that by comparing... Mark's gospel to John's gospel. So if I, I will flip over. You stay in Mark 14 and verse 1. And I will read to you John 12, verse 1. And John 12, verse 1 through 8, contains a very similar account to what's recorded in Mark 14. But there are some important differences. So when I start reading John 12, and it talks about how Jesus is anointed by, Mar uh, by Mary in Lazarus' house, it says... Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Well, in Mark's Gospel, the 14th chapter, the account that we're reading, we're reading about an event that takes place two days before the Passover. So four days before the Passover puts us the day before the triumphal entry. So the day before the triumphal entry, Jesus is in Bethany at Lazarus' house, and the same thing happens then. He is anointed by, this, uh, by Mary in that first case, uh, and the, all the other, uh, so a lot of the other details are, are actually very similar. And so there's a, a, a different way of, of dealing with that discrepancy, if you can call There's no discrepancy in Scripture, but people call this a discrepancy. Now, some people will say, the account in John and the account in Mark, they're the same thing. It's just that Mark is arranging his material topically. And so in 14 verse 1, when it talks about two days before the Passover, that doesn't apply to what Mark's recording in verse 3. And so verse 3 takes place at the same time as this account in, in John 12 uh, takes place. But the more natural reading of the text shows these two events to be separate. 
verse 1 in chapter 14 of Mark's gospel is a time stamp. This is a very chronological progression in the last week of Jesus' uh, life before his crucifixion. And as they, they come to Bethany in this account, it makes more sense to say this is two days before the Passover. So there are two anointings. It's not the first time that we run into this kind of problem in the Gospels. But there's not a problem uh, for God, of course. It's more a problem with how we see it. So remember the account of Jesus cleansing the temple. Uh, it happened just a few days ago in Mark's Gospel. Well, in John's gospel, the cleansing of the temple takes place at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so that doesn't create a problem for a person who trusts the scriptures, of course. For a person who trusts what the scriptures say, you say, okay, well, there were two cleansings of the temple. One was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and one was at the end of Jesus' ministry. And the same thing is true of these two anointings. It is much easier to take what the Bible says at face value. In John's gospel, he's talking about an event that took place six days before the Passover. In Mark's gospel, he's talking about an event that took place two days before the Passover. And I think reading scripture, taking its words at face value, makes you need less gymnastics, so to speak, when you're reading the word of God. It, it makes you able to just trust what God has written, say, okay, he wrote it, uh, he, God doesn't make mistakes. I will make mistakes, but God doesn't make mistakes. And so we understand these two things as, as separate events. And so we have uh, Passover takes place on Saturday in this, account, in this account. We know that because uh, Christ is raised the day after Passover and, and Christ is raised on the first day of the week. So, um, uh, so, so the Passover uh, is on Saturday. That puts this event that we're talking about, the Thursday before Passover. That means Christ's crucifixion is taking place the next day. So we are on Thursday. Christ is going to be crucified on Friday. He's going to be in the grave on Saturday. And he's going to be raised from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. And, and this is where this is the kind of tight timeline we're dealing with in, in Mark's gospel. Now, in our text here, in this description of, of what takes place in the house of Simon the leper, uh, this woman comes in with an alabaster flask, and it talks about this ointment that is of pure nard and very, very costly. And so we could be tempted to kind of get drawn into the weeds about what nard is, but I don't think that's necessarily helpful, uh, nor is it necessarily important. Uh, it's enough to know that this is a very fragrant ointment, that the, the woman puts on Christ. The compelling part of the text and, and what, what the Lord is teaching us through this text doesn't deal with the specific nature of what Christ was anointed with. It's the cost of the thing with which Christ was anointed. It's more important that we understand that the ointment was very costly than we understand what, what nard is. And so in verse 5, we see this uh, estimate given as the disciples begin to complain. They say that this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. Now, a denarii, in order to put a modern equivalency on that number so we can track with the valuableness of this ointment, a denarii was a, a, an average daily wage. And it's hard to translate that over centuries and over cultures. And so the easiest way that I thought of that we can try to get a sense of what's going on here in this text is simply to take the average daily income in Richmond County and translate what 300 of those uh, uh, constitutes in terms of a daily sum of money. And when you do that calculation, this nard that Jesus is anointed with would have been worth about $66,000 in our numbers. And as this woman takes this very costly ointment and anoints Christ with it, the disciples, not all of them, it says, some of them begin to grumble. They begin to scold the woman. They begin to rebuke her. They begin to speak harshly to her. And their reason sounds so very good. They say this ointment could have been sold. We could have had $66,000 that we could have given to the poor to help them in their, in their needs. 
Now, uh, in John's Gospel, that account in chapter 12 takes place earlier than the one we're reading, four days earlier. It says in John's account that Judas Iscariot made exactly that complaint when Mary anoints Jesus. And so here you see kind of a growing sentiment among the disciples. First, it was Judas Iscariot, and that complaint from Judas Iscariot is, is gaining steam. And now you have the same thing happening again, the second time in a matter of four days, and now more of his disciples are complaining that this money could have been used to care for the poor. Now we know from John's gospel that Judas' rebuke of the woman does not come from pure motives. We know that in John's gospel, Judas was one who grumbles about caring for the poor, but he actually didn't care about the poor. What Judas liked was money. We know that because John says so in chapter 12 and verse 6 of that gospel, talking about Judas Iscariot's complaint against Mary's work of anointing Jesus, complaining to her, and explains why Judas complained. It says there, he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So Judas, when he begins his initial complaint, what's he thinking about? Well, Judas is thinking about cash flow. Judas is thinking, that's $66,000 that, that I don't have access to. That's $66,000 that I can't help myself to. Now, there's no need to think that all of Jesus' disciples in chapter 14 are thinking the same way. They're not all the keepers of the money bag. They're not all the ones who, who help themselves to, to the money that's found in that purse. Probably the other disciples were fairly sincere in their desire to help the poor with this money. But even if their motive is good, Jesus teaches them something else. Even though their motive may be good, Jesus says that the poor are not the most important thing in this moment. So, we don't say care for the poor is a bad thing. The care for the poor is a good thing. Uh, alms for the poor continues to be a practice of the church, uh, even in the early apostolic church. Even throughout our own day, we have the office of deacon, specifically uh, to care for the widow, for the poor, to help the needy. And in Galatians 2 and verse 10, you have the account of, of Paul going to Jerusalem to to present himself to the apostles, for them to verify what he's preaching, so that they could affirm his apostolic office. And as Paul explains his gospel to the apostles, they give to him their conditional blessing. And they say to Paul, rough paraphrase, you're doing a good work, keep doing it, but here's the condition as Paul describes it. Paul says, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So it's not that caring for the poor is a negative thing. The care of the poor is a good thing in the ministry of the church. But what Jesus is saying here in this text is that there are certain, certain circumstances in which the care for the poor isn't the most important thing for the life of the disciple. This is one of those moments. See, the woman anoints Jesus. The, dis the disciples rebuke the woman, and Jesus rebukes them. Why? Because she is honoring Christ, and that is more significant at this time than their desire to care for the poor. Now, there are times when you honor Christ by caring for the poor. But here Jesus is saying there is something going on where his honor is even higher. It's, it's higher than having him honored in his care for the poor. She is preparing his body for the tomb. And Jesus' body will be in the tomb within 24 hours from this event. Jesus is less than 24 hours away from his death at this point. 
And so as she honors Christ in anointing him with this precious ointment, uh, uh, sacrificial anoint, uh, uh, anointing of Christ by this woman, she proclaims him to be the most important, more important than other good things. For everything there is a season. Yes, there's a season to care for the poor and there's a season not to care for the poor, but to honor Christ in, in anointing his body for burial. And as she honors Christ in this way, Christ proclaims, that she will be honored by his people. In some sense, Christ prophesies at that moment the very thing that's happening right now. Christ says that, that this woman's actions will be proclaimed throughout time, throughout the world, uh, for, for, her, for her selfless act of, of honoring Christ in that way. Isn't it amazing? How far are we away uh, from, from Bethan? Uh, we're hours by plane. Uh, we couldn't have even gotten there centuries ago. Uh, we are so far away, and yet this woman's action is held up as a primary example of how to honor Christ appropriately. The unnamed woman's act of love for Christ is, is held up as understanding the greatest value that she has in her life. It's greater value than, than care for the poor. And wherever and whenever this text is preached throughout all of history, Christ is honored on account of the way that this woman honors Christ. And so in this, this account, we have a depiction of the surpassing value of Christ. There are many other good things but they are all to be subservient to the glory of Christ. And this woman's actions rightly honor Christ as the most important. And that should be embraced. That should be the way we respond in our lives, that, that Christ should be preeminent for us, that, that we look to Him for our decisions and everything, that we uh, worship Him in, in all circumstances, but that's not embraced by everybody. And it's not appreciated by everybody. And you see that in these, these two other texts that kind of are cushioned around this account of Christ's anointing. We see also kind of this hatred that people have for Christ. And so there are, in some sense, bookends of evil that surround this, this anointing of, of Christ. Uh, the, the, the bookends of evil uh, that, re, that are, are, are blasphemous responses to Jesus' declaration about himself. And in these bookends, we see kind of two people, two kinds of people, two kinds of rejection of Christ. And in verse 2, you see the first kind. The, these are the people who have already made up their mind that they're going to do away with Christ. They've never liked Him. They've never accepted Him. They simply want to rid uh, the earth of Him. And in verses 1 and 2, we see that to be the chief priests and, and the scribes. They're intentions have been the same the whole time that Jesus has been in Jerusalem, for sure. Uh, we, we met them back in chapter 11, verse 18, right after Christ had cleansed the temple. And, and after, as Christ uh, cleansed the temple, Mark 11, verse 18, tells us that the, the priests and the scribes and the elders were seeking to destroy Him. So these men have never had a use for Jesus. They don't want Him. They don't love Him. They don't like what he's saying. They don't like what he stands for. These religious leaders are, are filled with this kind of destructive hatred for Christ. And it seems like their violent reaction uh, to Christ stems from his popularity. It stems from his teaching, from his influence. In, in terms of popularity, they view Christ as a threat. He's a threat to their position. In terms of Christ's teaching, they view him as an aberration. He's a, he a threat to their traditions. And that should be very, very, very sobering for us. Because these are not the ignorant masses. The priests, they were the keepers of the temple sacrifice. And the scribes were the interpreters of the law. And this text shows just how deep the hatred of the religious leaders runs. What does it say 
in our text, in verse 1, they were seeking how to arrest him by stealth. For what end? So that they could kill him. They're seeking to arrest him by stealth and kill him. Well, just in that sentence alone, think of what these religious leaders are doing in terms of violating God's law. Uh, first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And these men are saying, my position, my tradition, my place, that's my God. Second commandment, don't make yourself a graven image. And they've replaced worshiping the true God with a worship of their tradition. Third commandment says, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And they view Jesus Christ as a curse. And they want to kill him and murder him. The fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. Deal respectfully with your authorities. Or even if you grant in their case that, that they don't know that Christ is the son of the living God. And so they view Christ as their inferior. The responsibility of a superior to an inferior is one of care, one of concern, one of protection. But they want to kill and murder this man. The sixth commandment is pretty obvious. You shall not murder. That's exactly what they're trying to accomplish. The ninth commandment says, uh, do not bear false witness. Well, they're trying to arrest him in what way? Are they trying to follow the judicial process, present evidence of his guilt and be satisfied if the court finds him not guilty? No, they're trying to arrest him by stealth. They're trying to secure an outcome without bearing truthful witness about him. And the 10th commandment says, you shall not covet, and they covet his influence. They covet his place. They covet his teaching. They cover, covet his importance. They're inv involved not in the pursuit of justice, but they're in a covert operation. And the end of this operation is to murder this man so that they can get him out of their way. And the scribes are the interpreters of the law. They know the law inside and out. But they have hated Christ from the beginning. And they have never followed him. They have never, never sought to understand him. They have only sought to cast aspersions to the things that he said, to doubt the things that he has done, and they desire to rid the world of him. But there's another kind of evil, uh, an evil response to what Jesus says. And that second response is seen in those who begin with Christ, but then they turn their backs on him. And that is, of course, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot had, had all the privileges. He had all the advantages of being a disciple of Christ. Think about what Judas Iscariot had in his life. He firsthand saw the miracles of Christ. He collected the bread in the feeding of the 5,000 and put it into ba in the baskets. He saw Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. He heard Jesus' voice command the, the storm to be still, and it happened. He saw it. He was there. In fact, he even shared in Jesus' ministry. Earlier on, as Jesus' ministry is unfolding, he gives authority back in Mark 6. He sends out his 12 disciples. He gives them authority over unclean spirits. He gives them authority to heal the sick and proclaim the gospel. And Judas Iscariot did those things. He cast out evil spirits, healed the sick, and proclaimed the gospel. So if you were to look at Judas Iscariot, you would think this man is all in. But at some point, something changes. There's a point where Judas says, this is not worth it. Jesus isn't good enough for me. There's something that I love more. There was an accumulation of frustration within Judas, uh, and there was at one point the straw that broke the camel's back. And it's not clear entirely in Mark when that moment comes, but in Matthew it is entirely clear. In Matthew's gospel, when we have this account of Jesus anointing in the house of Simon the leopard, in verse 16 of Matthew 26 it says, 
From that moment on, Judas sought an opportunity to betray him. Four days ago, it was Mary's anointing, $66,000 lost. This day, an unnamed woman's anointing, another $66,000 lost. And that's enough for Judas. He's had it. He wants to betray Jesus into the hands of the religious leaders. And so the end result is the same, isn't it? In the religious leaders, it's their position and their tradition that makes them turn their back on Christ and say, he is not worth it. And in Judas, there's something else, but the outcome is the same. Judas' love for money and his, the, the failure of Jesus to deliver it for him makes Judas say in some point in his life, this is enough. I hate Christ. I would have him dead. And there you see the contrast. This unnamed woman who anoints Christ with this precious ointment. He, she cherishes him, honors him, clings to him, proclaims by her actions that Christ is all for her. But then you have the priests and the scribes and, and Judas Iscariot, and, and they despise him. They plot against him. They want him removed. Now, for some, that hatred comes right at the start. As soon as they hear of Christ, they want nothing to do with him. But others, they seem to be his disciples. They develop a hatred for Christ over time. But there is always something that's going on in those who reject Christ. There's always something that they value more than than Christ. In the parable of the soils, a couple chapters back in Mark, Mark chapter 4, there are four kinds of soil. And I want to focus specifically on the third kind of soil as a description of Judas Iscariot. In Mark 4, verse 18 and 19, as Jesus is explaining the meaning of this parable, he talks about other seed uh, that are the ones sown among the thorns. And they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. And that, my friends, is Judas Iscariot. And that could be anyone. A suppression of the truth, a love of an idol, a casting aside of the things you know of Christ because you've never belonged to Christ in the first place. And so this text points us and directs us to make Christ our first delight. What do the priests and the scribes and Judas fail to see? Well, they fail to see that Christ is more valuable than anything else that they possess. I can look far and wide and I can collect for myself great possessions and I can pursue positions of great power and attain to them and I can promote myself in such a way that I attain a level of great fame and I can immerse myself in the study of a subject matter so that I become an expert on it so that I know more on that particular issue than, than anyone else. And possessions and power and fame and expertise, these are all things that can be used to glorify God. But what happens if you have these things and Christ is left out of them? Isn't Christ far greater than any of those things? Even if you use those things for, from a human perspective for a good purpose, isn't Christ far greater than those things? Christian, Christ must be your first delight. Everything else has to take a back seat to Him. The, the priests and the scribes and Judas, they saw, they saw Christ as a hindrance, an interference. Well, do you see Him that way tonight? Is Christ getting in the way of your fun? Is His worship an obstacle 
to your success? What? You can answer, you can ask yourself, well, how, how do I know that? How, how can I tell? Well, think about it in terms of two ways. First, you can look at your actions. The affection that you have for Christ will be reflected in your actions. Because your loves are reflected in, in choices. In human relationships, we recognize it. Now, there's this, you know, we all, I think we all know about the love languages by now, right? Well, one of the love languages that, that, we're, that we're encouraged to think about in our families or in our marriages is that there are some people who like to receive gifts from others. And people who receive gifts from others don't need to have a huge gift. They can get a very small gift. Why is that? Because they recognize in the person getting something that in that moment they were thought of by that person. You, you can't do the action of buying a gift without thinking of the person. And so the action reflects the love of the giver. Now, up to the point where Judas chose to work with the priest, he seemed to be a faithful disciple. So how can a person evaluate your choices? Do you look at what other people are doing? Is it your job to see, uh, to evaluate other people's choices to see if they are disciples of Christ? Brothers and sisters, the important thing is to examine yourself and your choices. If they manifest a love for Christ, and the easiest way to examine yourself on this, I think, is to simply ask yourself, if somebody who didn't know me got to observe me for one day, would they say that Christ is first in my life? Would they say that he is most important? Now, uh, that is not to say, of course, that your choices and your behaviors, even when they reflect the commandments of God, are by necessity a reflection of love for God. Outward action does not always reflect an inward reality. But that is not to say that our choices are entirely irre irrelevant, that our choices don't in some way bear witness to uh, the condition of our heart and what we value as most important. But there is one more important measurement that you can't leave out of your self-examination of your actions. And that is by looking at your own heart. So you can tell if Christ is first in your life by looking at your actions, but looking at your actions in light of the condition of your heart. There is a call throughout Scripture that we would love God. And you see it in many different places in the psalm. So, for example, Psalm 31, verse 23, it says, Love the Lord, all you his saints. Or you can look in Psalm 18, and verse 1, where the psalmist cries out, I love you, O Lord, my strength. And that cannot be missing in the Christian's heart. There cannot be an absence of affection for God. Uh, there is a need for a genuine affection for God in your heart which sits behind your action. Remember this morning when we, we read the call to confession and we saw one of the summaries of the law and Jesus answered what is the most important law. And what is it? That you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, too often especially in our society, love has become some undefinable, fuzzy emotion. You know, uh, we love people who approve of us. We love people who make us feel good. We love people who, who do things for us. But that cannot be the kind of love you have for Christ. That is not the kind of love that the unnamed woman had when she anointed Christ. Understand your love for Christ by asking yourself one question. Why should I love Him? And what is your answer? How do you answer it? Because He blesses me? Because He gives to me? Because He cares for me? 
because He protects me? Well, all of those things certainly are true. God does that for His people. But let me ask you a follow-up question. Would Christ be worthy of your love if He did not bless you? If He did not give you what you wanted? If He doesn't seem to care for you? And if He exposes you to His enemies? Is he still worthy of your love? How would Joseph answer that question? In prison, in Egypt, sold by his brothers, is God seeming to bless him, care for him, protect him? Of course, love for Christ is rooted in far more than what he does for us. Love for Christ is rooted in who He is. His justice, His mercy, His power, His might, and all sorts of other things that belong to Him in His very nature. Those kinds of things which exist independent of our experience of them. And yes, it is good to delight in the blessings of God. It is good to delight in Uh, when we see that He is giving to us, when we recognize and experience that He's caring for us, and, and when we recognize His protection over us. But do we ever think of love for God flowing from the fact that He is God? Start with the fact that God is Creator. Do you love Him? That He is the Creator? What does that mean? It means that without God, you wouldn't even be You wouldn't be. Before He's done anything for you, you wouldn't be if there was no God. Do you praise Him and worship and adore Him because He created? It's best to have that kind of foundation for the love of God. A love that is not dependent on the things that you might receive from Him, but a love that is given to Him simply because of who He is. Now, if you set your love on Christ based on your experience of it, of course your love for Him can change. But love for God that is not based on circumstance, not based on what He gives you, does not change. Now, perhaps it's natural to think and to experience in certain circumstances things that make your love for God spike, that increase it dramatically in some sense. But at the same time, we have to listen to the testimonies of our brothers and sisters. Those who experience great comfort and joy in their agonies. Those that sing and praise Him as they are dying. Those that glory in His name as they are martyred for their faith in Him. What do you do with these testimonies. Is that not the greater love? The tested love? The mature love? See, the priests and the scribes, they they never saw Christ as valuable. They were committed to their status. They were committed to their tradition. And there was no way that this Jesus of Nazareth Nazareth was going to knock them off their perch. That's how they saw it. They saw it as a competition. Judas thought that there was something to Christ, that he could give him the things that he needed. But his love for money would eventually overpower what he thought to be good in Christ. But here in this text, Christ holds up for us another example of love for him. And it's the example of this unnamed woman. She demonstrates Christ's value in anointing his body for burial, anointing his body with this precious gift, this expensive ointment. And though the love for, poor, for the poor is a good thing, Jesus here shows that holding him in the highest regard is of more importance than any other good thing. 
This is the testimony of this unnamed woman. And wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told so that we would love and glorify Christ as she did. Let's pray together.